Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible, praise God, is our only standard and authority for truth. And together God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is February the 2nd in the year of our Lord, 2018, and this is one a day for the soul. Now, we're continuing our journey through the story of the Bible, and today we come to the end of Genesis, and we do so by looking at the death of Jacob, of Joseph, and then of Joseph's final wishes before he departs to the place of his father's. And so we pick up in chapter 47, and we see in verse 13 that there was no bread in all of the land. There was no food. The famine was extremely sore. And all the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. They were without hope. And had it not been for the providence of God through the life of Joseph, they would not have survived through this famine. And so verse 14 says, Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. Now you're going to see that Joseph was a very shrewd businessman. In verse 15, it says, when money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and they said, give us bread. For if you do not, we will die. And so Joseph said, give me your cattle. Well, he's already taken all of their money. So the only thing they have left to barter with is going to be their cattle, their land, and their homes. And so he says, give me cattle and I will give you food in its place. And so in verse 17, they brought their cattle unto Joseph. They brought their horses and their flocks their asses and all their cattle. And Joseph in turn gave them food. Well, after they ran out of that food, in verse 20, it says, Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. For the Egyptians sold every man his field in order to stay alive during this famine. So they traded their lands, their properties for food. And in the process of all of this, it all now belongs to Pharaoh, no longer the people. And so the people, having given everything that they own in order to stay alive, Joseph says to them in verse 23, Behold, I have bought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. You now belong to Pharaoh. And they said in verse 25, You have saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. And so Joseph makes a law that a fifth of all they have is going to go to Pharaoh and then they are to keep four parts for themselves so that they can revive themselves after the plague, after the famine. And Israel, which means Jacob and all his family, dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen specifically, and they had possessions, they grew and they multiplied exceedingly. Now keep that in mind because that's going to be very important in the next story that we pick up. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So his entire age was 140 and seven years. And the time drew nigh in verse 29 that Israel must die. Jacob must die. So he called his son Joseph and said unto him, If now I found grace in your sight, put your hand under my thigh, which was a sign of an oath about to be given, and deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt among foreigners, among strangers, but take me back to the cave of Machpelah where our forefathers are buried and bury me with them there. And so Joseph agrees to do this. And in verse 31, the vow, the oath is complete. Now, chapter 48 begins by saying that a messenger comes to Joseph and says, your father is sick. And so Joseph goes to his father with his sons that he bore in Egypt, Manasseh and Ephraim. And even though they are born in Egypt, in chapter 5, as Jacob is giving his blessing unto his son, he says, your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt, before I came unto thee, before I moved here, they are mine. They belong to me. They are now a part of the covenant promise that God gave unto me. 
where he says in verse four, God said, I will make thee fruitful and I will multiply thee. I will make thee of a multitude of people. I will give this land to thy seed and for thee an everlasting possession. And so now, even though Ephraim and Manasseh have been born in Egypt, they are a part of that covenant promise. And you're going to see them play a very important role in the tribes of Israel throughout the history of Israel. Well, it says in verse 8, Jacob, or Israel, beheld Joseph's sons. And he said, Who are these? And Joseph said unto his father, They are my sons whom God has given me in this place, in Egypt. And Jacob said, Bring them unto me, I pray thee, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Jacob, because he was an old man, were not that good. They were dim for age, and he had a very hard time seeing. And so when Joseph brought them unto his father Jacob, Jacob embraced them and he kissed them. And he says unto Joseph, I never thought that I would see you again, yet God has shown me kindness by not only seeing you, my son, again, but by seeing the seed of your seed, by seeing your offspring by seeing these your children. And Joseph brought his children unto his father, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth, preparing himself to receive the blessing. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, which would be toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand, which would be toward Israel or Jacob's right hand, and he brought them near to his father. But notice this, because this is going to be very important to the story. Jacob stretched out his right hand, but he laid it upon Ephraim's head. But Ephraim was the younger of the two brothers. Now, it should be the elder that should always receive the higher blessing. But Jacob places it upon the younger brother's head. And he put his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly. He knew exactly what he was doing. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me and took care of me all my life, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless these two lads and let my name be named on them in the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Now, when Joseph saw that his father had put his right hand upon the younger son, it displeased him. And he moved his father, or he tried to move his father's hand from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head, from the younger son's head to the older son's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Joseph is assuming that because his father's eyesight is weak, that he's made a mistake. But remember, Jacob knows exactly what he is doing. And Jacob refused Joseph and said, I know my son, I know what I am doing. The older son will become a people and he will be great, but truly the younger son will be greater than he and his seed will become a multitude of nations. And so Jacob blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Jacob bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim, the younger son, before Manasseh, the older son. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God will be with you and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren. So Jacob blesses Joseph higher above the other brethren. Although in his blessing in verse 10, you will see actually verse nine, he blesses Judah. And this is the line from which Jesus, the Messiah will come. And so most of chapter 49 is the blessing that he imparts to each of his children. But he does say unto Judah, you are a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you are gone up. And he says in verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh or Messiah shall come. And unto him, Shiloh, Messiah, shall the gathering of the people be. And this again is a promise of the coming one, Jesus of Nazareth. Now in verse 28, we pick up and we see the final days of Jacob. Now, having given his blessing to each of his 12 sons, in verse 28, it says, all these are the 12 tribes of Israel. 
Now, in the next few verses, he charges his sons that they will not bury him in the land of Egypt, but they'll take him back to the land of his fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and even in the land where his wives were buried, and they would bury him there. And it says in verse 23, when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed, he yielded up the ghost, and he was gathered unto his people. Now Jacob wept over his father, but being an Egyptian in in verse 2 of chapter 50, Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And so the physicians did embalm Israel. Now after a customary time of mourning passes, verse 4 says, when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spoke unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, if I found grace in your eyes, let me go and bury my father in the land of Canaan. And Pharaoh in verse 6 says, go, bury your father according as he has made you swear. And it says in verse 13 that Joseph and his sons carried him into the land of Canaan as he had requested and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah where Abraham and Isaac and even Jacob's wives had been buried. And Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, And notice this in verse 15. When Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said among themselves, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And so they sent a messenger unto Joseph saying, your father before he died commanded us saying, forgive your brothers for their trespass when they sold you into slavery. Don't hold it against them. And when Joseph heard these words, he wept. It broke his heart that his brothers would think so lightly of him. He had forgiven them many years ago. And yet it is their assumption that the only reason that he has been graceful with them is because their father was alive. And now they are implying because their father is dead, Joseph is going to wreak havoc upon them is going to treat them unmercifully. And this breaks his heart because his brothers should know his heart, that he is a kind and loving and caring and gentle man, that his forgiveness was not a pretense based upon his father being alive, but it truly came from his heart. And we have to assume that there were many times when they spoke together They talked together, they shared with one another, they rehashed this over and over, and yet even though Joseph forgave them, they were unable to forgive themselves. They carried this with them, and it broke Joseph's heart that they would think such things of him. Well, it continues in verse 18. It says, his brother went and fell down before him. It said, behold thy servants, with an emphasis on servants, They're trying to butter him up. And yet Joseph says unto them what he's always said unto them. Fear not, for am I in the place of God? Vengeance belongs to the Lord. Vengeance isn't in my hand, even though I'm a ruler in Egypt. Vengeance does not belong to me. It belongs to God. But as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good so that many people, including yourselves and your families, would be kept alive during the seven years of famine. But do not fear, my brothers. I will not harm you. I will nourish you. I will take care of your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. What grace we see in the life of Joseph. What patience we see in the life of Joseph. What compassion we see in the life of Joseph. The same compassion, the same mercy, the same grace, the same forgiveness that we see through the life of the Lord Jesus. And that's why the comparison of the life of Joseph in so many ways resembles that of the life of Jesus. And so the chapter ends and Genesis ends by saying, Joseph remained in Egypt. He lived all his days in Egypt, and Joseph lived a hundred and ten years. And Joseph said unto his brothers, I am dying, but God will visit you. He will bring you out of this land 
unto the land which he sware to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, his brothers, saying, God will surely visit you, and when he does, make sure that you carry up my bones out of this place. And we're going to see that happen. Joseph will be buried in Egypt, but eventually his bones will be carried from Egypt and taken into the land of Canaan, the promised land. And so verse 26 ends by saying, Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him. And he was put in a coffin in Egypt. And that being the end of Genesis, of course, is where we're going to end today. We'll next pick up in the first chapter of the book of Exodus. But as we close, I want to focus on the fact of what we addressed, that Joseph's brothers, although forgiven by Joseph, were unable to forgive themselves. And isn't that such a trait, such a characteristic of you and I? The Bible tells us when we repent of our sins, God no longer remembers them. They're cast as far as from the east is to the west. Yet we carry them with us. Shame on us for doing so. We carry them with us each and every day. But if Jesus has forgiven us, if he has buried our sins to be remembered no more, we too, friends, need to put our past behind us. As Paul said, we need to forget those things that are behind and we need to press on to the goal that has been set before us, not allowing the enemy to grieve us, to overshadow us, and to haunt us by our past mistakes, as many as they may be, but standing in the grace that the Lord pours upon us each day, knowing that our sins are forgiven. And just as he has forgiven them, so too we need to forgive ourselves. You know, that's, I don't know if you've ever thought about it before, but that's the difference between Peter, who sinned against the Lord, and Judas, who sinned against the Lord. It appears that Peter was able to forgive himself and move on to higher things. But Judas could not do so and ended up taking his own life. Friends, if we allow our sins to constantly pursue us, we're going to be kept from some of the most promising things that the Lord has in store for us. So resolve within yourself today to put your sins behind you. And as it has been said by so many others before me, when the enemy reminds you of your past, you simply remind him of his future. Oh, hallelujah. What a difference in our lives if we would do that each and every time. We have been forgiven. He never will be. Eternal glory and life with Jesus awaits us. Eternal suffering and destruction and a life empty of God awaits him. Yes, we may have sinned. Yes, we may have failed the Lord. But we don't stand in the mistakes of the past. We stand in the hope and the potential of the future. Hallelujah, friends. Well, I'm so grateful again that you're with us. I pray that you have been truly blessed so far through our study through the book of Genesis. I pray that you have learned many lessons that are transforming you into a better servant of the Almighty. And I trust and pray that you anticipate great things for we haven't even begun to scratch the surface. There are many great stories that lie ahead of us. And as we study each of these stories, it is our desire to draw out as much application as we can so that we can be found more faithful in his sight. Now, as he wills and until tomorrow, friends, I truly love you and I'll see you on the next video.